to start off by asking a question. Well, let, me, let me read my text. Let me read my text first, and then I'll ask you a question. Uh, Matthew 28, let's start in verse 16. This is Jesus talking here. Um, it, the Bible says, The eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for a commission. <laughs> That, Lord, we don't have to sit around and wonder what it is you've called us to do. Lord, we don't have to sit back and, and, and hope and, and, and pray that you have a plan for us. God, your word's already laid out a plan for us, and I'm thankful for that this morning. I'm thankful, God, that, that nothing catches you by surprise. You knew exactly who was going to be here this morning. Lord, that you're a sovereign God, and, and Lord, nothing, you, you knew it from beginning to end. Uh, Lord, long before we even had an idea that you knew it from beginning to end. And so, Father, I pray right now uh, that you would speak to our hearts, that, Lord, you would cut to the quick of the deal, and, Lord, that we would be changed or aggravated or something else. I, I pray, Lord, that, that we would walk out of here, though, more than anything, willing to do what it is you called us to do. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit may guide our time here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I pray that you do what it is you do. In Jesus' name, amen. How many folks in here have a family tree? Raise your hand. Either you don't want to stink and raise your hand, or you, something's wrong, okay? I'm going to ask a question. This is one end that everybody can get right, I promise you. You may have been like me, a C and under type student that they were just glad to get rid of. But I can get an A on this one, and so can you. How many people got a family tree in here? There's still some of you ain't got no family tree, which is freaky, okay? <laughs> Everybody's got a family tree, okay? I'll just give you that one. I'm, I'll be the professor and you be the student for a minute, as odd as that would be. But everybody's got a family tree. Whether you know it or not or whether or not you've logged into Ancestry.com and for some crazy reason sent them your DNA so you can find out you're Scots-Irish like all the rest of us are, um, I, I don't know why you would do that, but I understand. And so everybody's got a family tree. And within that family tree, you want it to be pretty doggone lush, don't you? Full. God, it is, I know it's rainy outside, but yeah, the answer is yes. I want my family tree to be lush. I want my family tree to be full, okay? Because when your family tree is not full and lush... You're backwards. You're from, am I going to say the states? <laughs> Whatever states you think is backwards, maybe you're from Tennessee and you think Tennessee's backwards, insert your state, because I know there's a lot of people from Mississippi, Arkansas, and Alabama that I would normally say Louisiana. Um, uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to say that, West Tennessee. Um, um, so I'm not going to put y'all in the category of that deal. But for us people that have lush trees, well, you want them lush. Because when they're not lush, they're jacked up. Something's wrong. People's, you know, they're, they're just, they, you know, you ever met that person that just ain't right? Yeah. Ask them to email you a copy of their family tree and it'll explain so much. Okay? So people want their family tree to look like this. Right? Am I right? Nice and big. It's lush. It's plenty of branches on it. You know, I don't want to sit there. And, it's got plenty of deep roots. It's a big family tree, and it's, it's nice. That's, that's a real beautiful tree. Unfortunately, you see people at Walmart, those are the ones that wear pajamas, and, no, and their feet are dirty, and they don't have no socks or shoes on, and they're pretty gross, you know? And you're like, oh, my gosh, what in the mess? You wonder what people's thinking. There, this may be, and that may, if that's you, I'm sorry. I love you, but golly, get some clothes, okay? The, you know the people I'm talking about. That's why it's funny. Here's their family tree.
Now listen, I'm not the brightest guy in the world, and some of y'all ain't either, but I think I want to go with the first picture and not the second picture. Would you agree with that? Was that you? Second picture's pretty doggone bad, but again, listen, again, sometimes backwardness might, you might be able to go back and you may look and you may see something that's totally different. Listen. When you think of a family tree and you think of your, your ancestors, your lineage, where, where it is you come from, some people's really big on that and they study that deal and, man, they know to a deal and I think that's fantastic. I, I don't personally know. I'm not really into all that kind of deal, but some of you are. It's, it's great to know where you come from and I, I, I'm, I'm for you doing it. But what happened was is you're here on planet Earth today because somewhere down the line, two people fell in love, and they got married, and they had some kids. And then they had some kids. And then they had some kids, and so on and so forth. And so here you are, planet Earth, at 1025 Brewer Road in Etheridge, Tennessee, this morning. Would you agree that's a true statement? Somebody has passed on to you, by the grace of God, life's blood, Somebody birthed you. Whether you like them or not, don't make no difference, but someone birthed you at some point. If they hadn't birthed you, you would not be here. Our families should have an extensive, and I was just joking about the single branch deal. Surely to gosh, it ain't all that prevalent, I pray. But our, when we look back at our family, if we were to do a family tree, we look and we see, man, where all we come from and how these people played this different part, whether we ever knew them or not. And they pass on from generation to generation. Some of you, you know, you know, all of you have a last name that was passed on long before you, I mean, long before you were ever here and long before your great-grandparents were ever here. And then now here you are. Jesus gives us a picture of what the church should be about within that same exact context. Now, he doesn't mention anything about a family tree, but what he talks about is multiplication. You're here because of multiplication. You know, I've got five kids, right? If all of my five kids have two children, how many grandkids will I have? And if all of my grandchildren have ten, or excuse me, are all my grandchildren equal 10, and they all get married, and they all have two children, then how many great-grandchildren do I have? 20. I'm passing on something that is moving further than myself, okay? And, you know, I'll have a, a, a heritage. I'll have at some point, if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back between now and then, I'll pass on a, a legacy name, and maybe the next generation knows me, maybe the next generation doesn't know me, and so forth, uh, so forth and so on throughout more children and them having children. And before you know it, a big old full family tree, hopefully. I want you to take a step back and I want you to picture the church in this same way. The reason why so many of you are here is through multiplication, not really addition and subtraction, Okay, even though some had this amount, some had this amount or whatever, you were here because a mom and dad at some point or a husband and wife got together, became a mom and dad, and they multiplied themselves, had kids which multiplied themselves, and so we had grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and so on and so forth. The church is really about the same thing. Sometimes we get wrapped up on addition and subtraction whenever we've got to worry about and think about multiplication. And so we see Matthew 28. This is after the resurrection. This is after Jesus has appeared to so many people. And it's all about what it is we're going to do with the resurrection. What is it? You've experienced the resurrection. You know that the resurrection is real. You've experienced Jesus. You've seen Jesus. He saved you from your sins. You're beginning to, to read the scriptures. It's beginning to make sense. It's, it's changing your life. But what do you do, it, do with it from there? Do you keep it to yourself? Do you keep the gospel to yourself? No, you take it out. You take it as you were going. Not only does it infiltrate your life, but it infiltrates your speech. And, and, and you begin to branch out and you begin to talk about the things of the Lord with other people. But you've got to change 
your idea of how a church truly is grown. A church is truly grown not through addition and subtraction, but multiplication. It's me investing in you. It's you investing in someone else. It's them investing in someone else, and so on and so forth, and on down the line, guys. You know, my ministry at Thousand Hills Cowboy Church as a pastor of the last seven years, you know, I am a product of other men that have invested in me. A lot of the things that I say, a lot of the things that I have been taught have been through other men at some point. And basically what I'm doing is is I'm echoing the things that they were taught by the men in their lives. Do Do you understand? And so really, the men that have invested in me are investing in you and not even knowing it, some of them, because some of them have already passed on or with Jesus. And the same is true for you. It, it, you can think about it whether or not you're in the cattle business or whether or not you like to fool with horses or whether you pour concrete or hang sheetrock. At some point, somebody pulled you to the side and says, this is how this is done. Right? And you could be a school teacher or a nurse or, or a doctor. Or, I'm sure we don't have any doctors in here. We're not upscale enough. But you know what I'm saying? If there was a doctor, you know, at some point somebody invested their lives in you and in me. And now we are passing that on to the, gener- the, the next generation. And guys, that is what the gospel is about. It is passing it down from generation to generation. The people that we are out. It is about multiplying yourself. You know, I hear preachers say all the time, well, how many did you have in church Sunday? And the question, better question is, is I don't know how many of those are making disciples. I'm just saying. What is the most important? Is it, would I rather have, you know, would I have, rather have a hundred people show up on a Sunday morning? Or would I rather have 10 men show up on Sunday morning who are investing in 10 men? The difference is, is the mindset that we have. Sure, I want to reach as many people as we can because the more people we reach, the more we can, we can spread the gospel and hopefully more people will come to know the Lord Jesus and more people will become church multipliers and disciple makers. But we've got to get out of our mind that it's about addition and subtraction, that it's, you know, 5,000 this week, 4,000 this week, 100 this week, 50 this week. We've got to get out of the addition subtraction mold and we got to figure out how do we get to multiplication this is exactly what jesus teaches us and he shows us how to do it look at uh verse 19 well first let's look at verse 18 because he says all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth so basically when someone speaks and says i've got all authority what do you do you perk up and listen He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. So the first thing he tells us to do is to go make disciples. Well, Jesus, where do you want me to do it? What is God's will for my life? Where should I be on mission at, Lord? Where where is it that you're going to send me? All nations. Huh? Well, shouldn't I pray about what area? No. Why pray? I done told you. This is what I want you to do. Make disciples of all the nations. And then this is what you need to do. You need to incorporate them into your fellowship, within your churches, by taking them through the first step of discipleship, which is the next thing, baptizing. You need to baptize them. That is them saying, hey, this is who I am. Jesus has saved me. I am now identifying myself through his death and resurrection through the symbol of baptism. That is incorporating into the fellowship of the church. But then look what he says. Not only baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then he goes back to what it is that you need to do after they're baptized. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. So not only are we supposed to go and make disciples, share the gospel, evangelize, bring them back into fellowship, but then we are to teach them, to show them what Jesus said, to disciple them, to multiply themselves. And then he goes on to say, and here's a bonus, and this is, we're going to talk about this more in depth next week. Here's the bonus. 
Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus said, I want you to do all this stuff, all these things, but remember on the back side of this, I am with you while you are doing this. I am going to empower you to get this accomplished. Don't, you don't have to worry about so much stuff. Just worry about this. I'm going to be there with you. And I'm going to help you through it. I'm going to give you the words to say. But guys, we have got to change our mindset. We've got to move to that full, lush tree as a church and not the single branch. Guys, there's lots of churches that are single branch churches. They're not multiplying themselves. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that as a Christian. I don't want to be that as a church. I want to invest in as many men as I can in my lifetime. Not for my glory, but for the Lord's glory. There is nothing, listen, there is nothing, and some of you men can identify with this, there is nothing that satisfies me more than to see men at some point that, that my life has, has, has been around, see them ministering and seeing them pour into other people. Nothing better. And when I think about the people that have poured into my own life over the years, maybe for a short time, maybe for a long time, it thrills me that I'm able to get up here and I'm able to stand in this pulpit and I'm able to preach and I'm able to pastor. And when I'm working on stuff for sermons or whatever else, I, I can almost hear it play back. Trent, you remember Mr. Cook? You know, when, when, I was a, when I was 18 years old, I was new to my faith. Uh, man, I, Jesus had saved me, and it was a crazy deal. And, and you know, I, I mean, I, I went through this deal called Promise Keepers. It was kind of a men's movement at the time. And uh, Mr. Cook was probably like 70 or 80 years old. He may have been younger than that, but it seemed when you're 18, like, you know, anybody that has like a speck of gray hair, you think is going, you know, about to have to go to the nursing home. I mean, that's just the way... That's the way you feel. And uh, I got teamed up with him. We, we had partners, prayer partners, that we met with throughout the week. And I was 18. He was like the oldest dude there. But he was, he was old but like radical. He wasn't traditionally minded. And so he was all about reaching people for Jesus. And the dude knew the word. I mean, he, just, man, he, was, he, was, a, he was a knowledgeable old dude. And I'm telling you, I met him with him. If you're old here today, I love you, okay? But he was a knowledgeable old dude. And... Uh, and, and, and I met him at his house. He lived in town there, had some big old oak trees there, and he had a picnic table in the front. And I'd go and I'd meet with him on Tuesday evenings, and, uh, and he would just share with me about life. Life. I mean, just he taught me what the Word said, he, he, but, he, but, but he just didn't want to sit down and do a Bible study with me. He wanted to talk about life, and he wanted to ask me about my struggles, and he wanted to ask me what he could be praying with me about. And He, he wasn't preachy, and he just, he just wanted to know about life, and he invested, and he poured into me. And there's so many things that I know now, and I was challenged in to learn then that I challenge y'all to know now. And I think about the investments that have been in my life, and you can think of the same thing. You were mentored or you were discipled, and there was that man that put his arm around you or that lady women that put their arm around you. So let me show you something other. And you took it in, and now you're teaching it to your kids, and you're teaching it to other young people that are around you. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about when it comes to multiplication, teaching those things that I have commanded you. You know, being a disciple of Jesus is more than Jesus saving us. It goes far beyond our baptism. It's really diving into the Word and knowing the Word and having someone pour into us and the Lord Jesus <coughs> pour into us through small group Bible studies and, and, and through uh, our own personal studies and those types of things, guys, but we can't keep it to ourselves. You see, the problem is, is that there's lots of knowledgeable people, but they're stupid. I'll say it again for those that are much more knowledgeable and a lot smarter than I am. But there's lots of knowledgeable people. They know what the Word says, but they're stupid. And not only are they stupid, they don't want to share nothing. 
They, they kind of take it on as their gospel, as their Bible study, but they don't ever share it with nobody else outside of maybe just their inner circle. That's not what we've been called to do. We've been called to make disciples of all nations. Hey, you've experienced the resurrection. You've seen Jesus rise from the dead. The grave is empty. We recognize that it's true. What are we going to do with it? Jesus is saying, here's what you do with what happened. Y'all want to know? I mean, you, you've seen what happened over the last several weeks, and I've appeared, and you know. And Okay, now it's time to move forward. What do we do? The church has got to be, it must be, about reproducing ourselves, multiplying ourselves in the lives, in the hearts of other people, what Jesus has to say. The church has been called to make disciples. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. There's a couple things. What do we do? What do we do? God calls us to evangelize. But realize that's not our main focus. What? That's not our main focus, you see, because there's multiple parts to this deal. Y'all heard before when somebody says, well, sum up what the Great Commission says. It says go. No, actually it doesn't say just go. It says go make disciples. And you see there's a process. There's a process to that. It's telling them what the gospel says. It's showing them what the gospel says, and then it's coaching them through what the gospel says. I talked about this six or eight or ten months ago or a year ago, I can't remember, but I talked about a corner post on a good fence. Three posts, right? A brace in the middle. You got your wire pulled tight on all sides. Man, that post is not going nowhere. It is the foundation for the post. And I talked about these posts, and I said, you've you got to make sure that if, if you're going to live a gospel-centered life, that not only do you tell them, but then you show them and then you coach them. It's a watch-me deal. Let me, let me show you how to get through this. Let me, let me call you up, or let me come by your house and say, hey, man, I've been through this deal. Let me help you through this situation in your life. Let me show you what the Word has to say regarding this point. Let me, let me show you what got me through whenever I was going through these same struggles. Let me love you. Let me, let me pray for you. Let me be an encouragement to you. Let me help build up your faith whenever it seems like your life is going to crap. But unfortunately, too many people in the church, they don't do that. They don't do that. They don't mean anything, anything ill towards anybody or anything like that, but they go to their Bible studies, they study the Word, they invest in themselves, but they never invest in anybody else. But that's not the Great Commission, guys. The Great Commission is not get as much Bible as you can and get as much knowledge as you can. That just makes you stupid. You know a lot, but you don't practice a lot. You're not teaching a lot. You're not imparting anything in anybody whatsoever. It's like your kids growing up never knowing how to do something. Right? I mean, what do you think about a grown man don't know how to change a tire? You know, I'm thinking, is there a grandpa? Is there a dad? I mean, we're, I mean sure, mama could probably do that. You know, you want to teach them those things, and you have, and you are teaching your children those things. But I'm talking about even the more important things in life. Are you passing on a culture, a hunger, a love for Jesus Christ in everything? And then I'm going to move past that. Are you passing that on in the places that you are? When you see somebody baptized here, are you trying to scoop them up before the other guy gets them and says, hey, man, I'd love to pray with you. Can I get your number? I'd love to pray with you, encourage you. Is there something that I can do for you? Man, I was, in that, I was being baptized myself just three or four years ago. God's taught me so much, man. Here's my number. If you ever need me, holler at me, text me, whatever. I'm here for you. I can pray for you over the phone. I'll get back to you whenever I get off the dozer or whatever it is. But I'm here for you, man. I've been there. I've been where you're at. And then you begin to invest in someone else's life. My challenge to you men, every man that calls himself a believer in Jesus Christ today, this week find another man that you can begin to invest in and encourage and equip. Ladies, my charge is the same to you. Find another woman 
that you can encourage, that you can equip. Not only, not only for living for Jesus, but a bonus. Jesus, what the Word says, how to get through these six, certain situations, how to be a man, how to be a woman. Now, not, not if you're a woman, how to be a man, or if you're a man, how to be a woman. That we got, that's, our, that's already been done, and nobody's impressed. So. But I, I, I say that we go retro. We go old school. We go Jesus on them and start teaching men how to be men. And women how to be women. Yeah, oh, man, what a concept. Yeah. Imagine what the church would look like if men were men and women were women. And I don't mean sexism. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being a chauvinist or a feminist. I'm talking about what does the Bible have to say about these deals? Men, you need to be at Testament of the Bulls. I'm going to throw that in there one last time. So how, what does God do here? Let's, let's take a look at these things. How, there's three main areas or principles that, that, that I, I think we can look at in the areas of discipleship, multiplication, or, or whatever you want to call it. The first one is this, relationships. The first one is rela- you've got to be building some relationships with people. Now, you say, well, I'm an introvert. I really don't, people excite me, and I don't like new people or whatever else. Look. Your calling's the same as mine, Jack. Get over all that. All right? Maybe you're just a high end. You don't like people. You got some issues, okay? We all know it, okay? You've got a personality disorder, but we're going to overlook it. Ask the Lord Jesus to help you not to be such a, you know, a high end. Invest in somebody. There's all sorts of issues. Maybe you've got an issue to where you feel like you're not worthy to invest in somebody else. Get over yourself. If the Lord Jesus has forgiven your sin and he's working on you daily to help you be an overcomer, think of the, think of the blessing. Think of the encourager you could be if you're able to pour your life into somebody else. Maybe you used to be a dope head, but you ain't no dope head no more. You need to be investing some dope heads. Maybe you used to be a whore. Hey, you ain't no whore no more. The Lord has sanctified you. The Lord has changed you. He's cleansed you. You know what you need to do? You need to be investing in somebody that's struggling with the same thing. Think whatever your niche is, whatever you found yourself in through life, the Lord Jesus wants to take that and use that in that multiplication process, in that changing and equipping of somebody else. And You can say, man, I've been there. Let me show you what God has done, how he's restored me, how he's changed me. That, my friends, is discipleship. It's beyond listening to instruction in a Bible study because this is real life living. How are you going to get somebody through this deal? But you got to build a relationship. you got to branch out. You understand. I'm going to talk about it next week. But Jesus basically said, look, this is where I want you to be my witnesses, and this is what's going to happen. First, I want you to start in Jerusalem. Where are you from? And then I want you to... Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. This is what you're going to do. This is what we're going to do. But you know what it takes? It takes people rethinking and get in the multiplication stage. Get out of addition and subtraction. Let's get about multiplying. How can I pass this on to the next generation? So we've been called to make relationships. We've also been called to teach. I want to read to you probably one of my favorite verses of for discipleship. It's in the, what I call the discipleship book. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, if you're taking notes, I'm just going to read it. It's going to be on the screen here. <clears throat> Paul says to a young pastor named Timothy, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, guys, that is the model of multiplication. We've seen it with Jesus. He picked 12, really hung out more with three, and even hung out a little step further with one. So he had the 12, and then he hung out more with John and James and, uh, and Peter, and then he actually invested a little bit more time in, in John himself. And so we see a model 
of Jesus reproducing himself. And I've told you all before, guys, there were thousands of quote, unquote, disciples. There were only 12 apostles. There were people, Jesus was a rock star, still is a rock star. Most famous history person there's ever been existed. And let me tell you something. People followed him where he went, but he invested in 12 and then invested more in three and then more invested in one. And that is the discipleship model. We see Paul, and we see Paul investing in a young Timothy here. And this is what he says. The things that you've heard from me, the things that I've taught you, what you need to do is you need to find faithful men, and then you need to tell them so they can tell others. That is multiplication. That's not addition and subtraction. He didn't say, hey, read my book, The 12 Steps to Grow Your Church. Okay? Okay? And he didn't look at the trend of, as well, this is an election year and this is what happens with churches and, you know, all of these number things and all. I mean, you know, guys, I'm not saying people are not important. Numbers are important because they represent people and all that other churchy stuff that we throw out there sometimes. What I'm saying is, is that I'd much rather have 10 men and women that would invest in 10 men or women than I would to have a, thou- a church of 1,000 that would sit there and look at me like this. I'd be able to tell my friends what success. I may have Lifeway wanting me to write a book. That would be bad because I don't have much to say, but I can't put it in right, and I wish I could. But I'll tell you this. I would always pick the 10 men and 10 women who would be willing to invest in 10 men and 10 women every single time. And maybe we wouldn't have as much fancy stuff, and maybe we wouldn't talk about building another building, and maybe we wouldn't be able to have the funds to do all the things that we want to do. But I promise you, if every person under the sound of my voice, if half of you, well, shoot, I'll be honest with you, if 10 of you would be willing to invest in one person or even 10 people this year, imagine what would change in our church and in Lawrence County, guys. You're talking about seeing a county, a state, a world on fire for Jesus. Have people that start thinking about their math a little bit differently in the way that they're going to invest. So we've been called to relationships. We've been called to teach. We've also been called to serve. Listen, you can't have all this knowledge about Jesus and then not be serving Jesus somehow, some way. Listen, you can serve Jesus right where you're at. You can serve Jesus in your yard. You can serve Jesus at your work, driving down the road. That's a hard one for me because you guys know I got road rage. You know what I'm saying? Look around where you're at and say, Lord, use me right here, right now. A lot of people will be praying. People always got to pray about something. I always say, dude, y'all are the prayingest bunch of people I've ever seen in my life. I mean, do you really got to pray whether or not you need to serve a hot dog or something at an arena event? Give me a freaking break. I mean, people showed up yesterday and scrubbed uh, chairs, you know? And they had the the Clorox wipes, and they're down there scrubbing your manure off your boots down there. And, I mean, they literally scrubbed every, every chair you're sitting in. People were here yesterday, scrubbed every inch of that chair. And I was thinking yesterday, I wonder if people come in here and said, Hey, I really need to pray about this, how... I need to see whether or not the Lord wants me to scrub that chair or not. And maybe one of y'all said that. You're stupid, but, I mean, I love you. (laughs) The Lord loves stupid people because he loves me, so I'm going to love you too. But I'm just saying, guys, you got to put the things that you learn, the things that you know, you got to put them into practice somewhere. And right now, maybe you're praying whether or not the Lord uh, would open up an opportunity for you to minister in a different job. Why don't you just minister in the job you've got? Why don't you minister in the neighborhood that you've got? Why are you praying about the Lord sending you out somewhere where you've got so many people in your circle that you can be dis- making disciples right here and right now? We ought to trip over ourselves. We ought to knock somebody down for the opportunity to do something for the kingdom of God. You ought to look for every single opportunity you can to serve the Lord Jesus. I'm not talking about cutting into your family time, guys. We got to serve our families too. Sometimes we can get so wrapped up in serving the church that we never serve our families. But I'm going to tell you, we got to serve our families and serve in the church too. We got to go to work, right? 
So you can't say, well, I'm just going to serve my family and serve the church and then just not show up to work because you get fired. And then you ain't got nothing. Then they come and take everything you got. And then it's kind of one of them bad deals. So you got to, I mean, you got to find balance is what you got to find in your life. But through all of this, what the beautiful thing about the, the gospel thing is, is that through your work and through your family and through your church and through even eating and even going to bed, you can glorify the Lord Jesus and make disciples as you were going 20-something hours a day. That's the good stuff. We have got to serve. What is a disciple? One who follows Jesus. What's a disciple maker? One who teaches others to follow Jesus. Will you teach others to follow Jesus? Well, preacher, that's what I thought you do. Well, yeah, it is, but I mean, I can't meet with all y'all. But believe me, I'm going to be doing my part. I have been the last 20 years. I'm going to continue. Will you do your part? Will we start seeing people's lives change? Will we be able to invest our lives? I mean, sure enough, invest them into people. You want to see a rocking church? You want to see a rocking state? You want to see a rocking world? Is when God's people start getting serious about reproducing themselves. When they get serious about branching out that family tree. Imagine a church with a big old family tree. It'd be less backwards if it did. The reason why so many churches are in trouble and wrecking out and got so many cotton-picking problems, the people aren't making disciples. They're worried more about grumbling and complaining and fussing because this didn't really go the way they thought it ought to go and all that bull crap. Shut up. We got more things to worry about than whether or not you think we should have done it this way or that way. And I'll be honest with you, there's lots of little old podunk churches out there that are single branches that you can go and serve in and fuss and cuss with them all you want to. And they got more room than we do. So the fact of the matter is, is the more, the more we concentrate on what God's called us to do in multiplication and figure the best way we can multiply ourselves in every single thing we do, the more that we will grow spiritually and the more we'll grow numerically, because it's got to happen that way. We don't have no, you don't have no choice. But we've got to move people to a deeper understanding of Jesus. If that ain't your deal, go find another deal. I mean, there's no love loss here. I mean, I, I love you and I'll wish you well and everything else, but that's what this church has got to be about moving forward. It's about knowing Christ and making him known. Would you agree? Let's make some disciples this week. I guarantee you why I've been preaching, somebody's come up in your mind. I don't think that's no accident. I believe the Lord put them there. Why don't you give them a call today or tomorrow? Ask them how they're doing, how you can pray for them, how you can encourage them. Hey, can we meet and pray this week before work? Hey, you can talk and pray over the phone. You ain't even got to get face-to-face. I mean, you ain't got to get face to face. Men, find some men. Women, find some women. Invest in them this week. Can we do that? Will you do that? Some of you have been doing it. I understand. This is all just like, man, hurry up. You know, I'm, done. I'm doing this deal. But some of you know you need to do it, but you ain't been doing it. Some of you, this is news to you. No matter what three categories you fall in today, let's do it for the glory of God. Amen? Hey, bow your heads and close your eyes real quick. Maybe this morning you don't have no idea what I'm talking about because you ain't saved. You don't know Jesus. You ain't had your sins forgiven. You may fall into one of them categories, and I'm saying people need to be ministering to. I, I don't know. The Bible's pretty clear about some things. One is every single person in this room has or had a sin problem, a sin problem that separates them from a holy God. The Bible says that all have sinned, so that means your granny, who you think never has said anything ugly in her life, she's sinned, she's in that category, I'm in that category, you're in that category. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, period. The Bible then goes on to say that the wages of that sin, what it is you earn, is death. That's what you deserve for your sin. <laughs> but I love this part. 
It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God gives us grace. He gives us something we absolutely do not deserve. We have not earned it. There's nothing about us that he looked in the future and thought, well, this cat's going to be pretty good. No, he gives us this undeserved grace because that is the kind of God that he is. This morning... If you've recognized your need for Jesus Christ in your life and, need, and understood your need for a Savior, I'm going to tell you what, today is the day to turn from your sins and turn to Him. If the Lord Jesus is drawing, him, drawing, drawing Himself, or He's drawing you to Himself, my prayer is that you'll come up front here, talk to some guys as everybody dismisses and heading out to the door trying to get to the place to get something to eat. There'll be some men here that would love to pray with you. Ladies, if you need a lady, their wives will be available as well. But I'll hope that you won't leave off this property today without getting things right. Maybe you just need prayer. You want to talk about baptism, that first step of discipleship. Maybe you want to just, uh, just unload on somebody. I don't know. These guys will be here available for you to minister to your needs. My challenge to every Christian in here today is find somebody you can invest in. I'm going to pray with you and going to get you going. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the excitement, Lord, you've called in me, caused in me over the last couple of weeks, Lord God, about making sure that I'm making my time count investing in, in the hearts and lives of people. Father, I pray that I would do that well. I pray these folks would do that well, that we would take serious what your word says. Empower this church, God, every step, every... Every step, every direction that we want to go, I pray that it would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. Empower us for the work, Lord God. Every day, may we look to you. In Jesus' name, amen.